Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an independent educational grant from Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Inc. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Thiel, Professor of Neurology at Harvard University School of Medicine in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to this program titled, How to Prepare Yourself and Your Practice for adults with rare pediatric onset epilepsies. Joining me today are Christina Baca, who is Associate Professor at Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, and Rima Nabut, who is Professor of Pediatric Neurology at Necker Hospital in Paris. Um, welcome. Rima and Christine, I'm very excited to do this with both of you, um, since I know that you have both focused on tr the topic of transition a lot. Uh, in your career. During the next half hour or so, we'll talk about the transition from pediatric to adult care for patients with rare pediatric onset epilepsies. We'll discuss the epidemiology of adults with these rare epilepsies, the changing needs of patients with these epilepsies as they transition to adulthood, and approaches for developing a plan for transition. First, a brief review of DEEs, looking at definitions. Uh, developmental encephalopathy is a condition in which developmental delay or intellectual dis disability due to a non-progressive brain state coexists with epilepsy. Epileptic encephalopathy is a condition in which epilepsy or epileptiform activity specifically affects cognitive and behavioral functions. And next, developmental and epileptic encephalopathy is a condition in which developmental impairment and epilepsy affect cognition and behavior. And as we know, the developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, or DEEs, are often associated with a genetic etiology. Uh, looking kind of at the newest ILE classifications of the DEEs, there are many of them kind of occurring at different times during childhood from early infancy on up until 10 years of age. And today we're going to be focusing primarily on lennox gastaut syndrome, or LGS, Dravet syndrome, or DS, and tuber sclerosis complex, or TSC. So first looking at Dravet syndrome, or DS, the estimated incidence is anywhere from 1 in 15,000 to 1 in 41,000. We know that many individuals that are clinically diagnosed with Dravet syndrome were found to have a pathogenic mutation in the SCN1A sodium channel gene. So this is a genetic epilepsy. We know also that individuals with DS has, have an increased risk of mortality at all ages, mainly due to sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, or SUDEP. But DS is a lifelong disorder persisting into adulthood. In fact, my oldest patient is in their 40s, and I think I know of a patient with DS who's in their 70s. And we also know that DS accounts for approximately 2 to 3% of patients with refractory epilepsy who do transition from pediatric to adult care. Next, turning to LGS or lennox gastaut syndrome, this accounts for about 1 to 2 percent of all persons with epilepsy. And as we know, LGS often evolves from other or another severe infantile epilepsy syndrome or etiology. So this is not a unique genetic epilepsy, but many different etiologies or causes can lead a child to develop lennox gastaut syndrome. And LGS persists into adulthood in nearly all cases. Then turning to tuber sclerosis complex, or TSC, this is a genetic disorder that affects 1 in 6,000 individuals worldwide, and this is a multi-system disorder that can affect almost any organ system. Progress depends on the severity of symptoms, and those with mild forms have a relatively normal lifespan. I, my oldest patient with TSC is currently in their 90s. So looking then at transition, what do we know about patients' and families' experiences with transition to adult care? Before we go further, 
Let's define a few more terms. First, preparation transition. That's the purposeful planned movement of adolescents and young adults with chronic physical and medical conditions from a child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems. And the optimal goal of transition is to provide healthcare that is uninterrupted, coordinated, developmentally appropriate, psychosocially sound, and comprehensive. Transfer is the formal event of passing care from pediatric to adult healthcare providers. So this is a study actually that Christine did um, in Connecticut, looking at 308 young adults, and they found that only 15 had had a transition discussion before they turned 18. And of 130 who had active epilepsy upon attaining um, adulthood, only 31 had had a transition discussion compared with 4% of patients with inactive epilepsy. And only 50% of those with active epilepsy were being seen by an adult provider at the time of the exit interview. A study in LGS looking at a survey of 133 healthcare professionals attending a symposium in LGS. 87% had tried to transfer a transition of patient to adult neurology care, uh, and most relied on a single transfer method, either letter of referral or a telephone call. Only 13% used a transition clinic, and most who responded to the survey were not satisfied with this transition process. Looking at transition in TSC, and this is a study from France, multi-center study of 60 patients aged 18 or older with tuberous sclerosis complex. The majority, 80%, had cognitive impairment, so most of the questionnaires were completed by family, about 50%. Two-thirds of these patients had gone through a transition, and the transition occurred between the ages of 16.5 years and 21 years. 60% of the patients considered the transition a good experience. They felt they received clear information about the adult care pathway, and they felt that the adult care physicians had clear knowledge about their medical history and the disease. Most felt that follow-up was not very regular in adult care, but only 3% felt that they would have been better followed if they had stayed in pediatric care. So overall, very positive experience for these patients transitioning to adult care. Uh, epilepsy and renal issues were the best followed, uh, and it was felt that the management of psychiatric and behavioral disorders, which is often a significant issue for adults and children with tuberous sclerosis complex, was felt to be still an unmet need. And we recently looked at transition um, from pediatric to adult in Dravet syndrome population in the United States. And this is a care-based survey done in association with the Dravet syndrome foundation in the United States. 46 responses were analyzed. And we found that 29 patients did not undergo transfer uh, and 20 because they were still followed by pediatric neurologists or epileptologists. 17 patients did undergo transfer or were in the process of transfer. Uh, the average age when the initial conversation about transition happened was at 19 years. And as we'll see later in our discussion, maybe that should have been earlier. The average age at which they saw an adult provider for the first time was 21.6 years. And five who responded were still seen by both the pediatric and adult providers during the transfer. I was actually happy to see the caregivers' perspectives were all pretty favorable. Um, both with regard to feeling that the adult care providers were attentive and able to accommodate the patients with behavioral issues, cognitive challenges. They were knowledgeable about caring for patients with intellectual disability or behavioral issues. They were knowledgeable about including caregivers in, in clinical decision making. They were also knowledgeable at Dravet syndrome, especially in adults, and importantly, attentive and available. So, Christine, I know you think about this a lot uh, and have researched this a lot. So, in your opinion, what are the common barriers to transition from pediatric to adult? I think there are numerous um, barriers to transition from the pediatric uh, world to the adult world, particularly with these rare epilepsy syndromes. I think first and foremost, we need to think about um, the attachment that can occur between families and, and their pediatric neurologists. I, I often think that, um, that patients and their families, their caregivers have got, undergone a, really a journey to sometimes even to get to the diagnosis. Um, and all the complexity that's involved with caring for these patients we can lead um, to a long lasting relationship and a lot of trust that has been built over years that leads to just an attachment that would be hard to leave um, and say goodbye to. We also need to think about the facilities where we provide 
care. Sometimes our adult space isn't always set up the way we need to to deliver care for our patients with really special needs. We need to think about transition um, particularly as it pertains to patients in this domain who do not always have the intellectual capacity to be making decisions for themselves. And they are going to be relying on their family or other caregivers or proxies to be helping them along this journey. Um, that paves a very different pathway for those who are not in that situation and will be paving their own path and achieving full um, independence as an adult. Medical records. I think we could talk a lot about this, but. Um, Sometimes we have no records in understanding how we proceed and how we care for a very complex patient with nothing in front of us as the adult provider can be overwhelming and can be a huge barrier to care. Now, if we are lucky to have records, sometimes we um, receive you know, a stack this big or um, the electronic health record can be full of so many records it could be hard to sort out, particularly uh, for patients who have had very long journeys and lots of testing over the years. So it's often important to think about that, not only in terms of having them or not having them, but the form they come in. Availability for adult neurologists. There aren't always the um, sufficient number of adult neurologists who are comfortable taking care of patients with real um, rare syndromes um, or just available in general in your community. So finding that person in your area or with that sp specific area of expertise can often be a challenge for patients. There's also a feeling that sometimes the adult neurologists um, don't always have the familiarity that pediatric neurologists have in terms of caring for patients who have very, very rare syndromes and may be um, treated with medications that adult neurologists may not be using on an everyday basis. Some uh, medications that come to mind are Vigabatrin, cannabidiol, fenfluramine, seropentol. So I think our pediatric colleagues have a lot more experience in this domain. Um, and it can it can create a sense that will this neurologist know exactly what we're what we need and what our patient and what our family member is taking. Um, I think there's a lot to think about also in terms of barriers in terms of the caregiver perspective. We're also thinking about the journey not only of the patient but of the family, those who are taking care of the patient, particularly since they are not going to be making this journey alone and will not achieve true functional independence. A large proportion of adult patients. Um, <clears throat> who are technically physiologically adults are still seen by pediatric epileptologists. Um, there is a fear, I think, of caregivers leaving kind of the pediatric neurologists and, and entering the domain of the adult neurologists and having that trust. There's also concern in terms of the um, the community resources uh, that may not always be aligned in terms of timing of the handoff in terms of the clinical resources. How we actually put these things together to make the journey more seamless can be very complicated and overwhelming for, for caregivers. While there may be some transition programs, sometimes these transition programs may not be uh, viewed by caregivers as taking care of the children with these rare diseases. A lot of transition programs may focus on people who um, are achieving functional independence and are able to advocate on their behalf. And sometimes that doesn't meet the needs of the families and the caregivers um, who are, are managing a different journey. Um, there's also this uh, concern, I think, with caregivers and families that I know I've experienced in being an adult uh, provider myself is that, why did I hear about this so late? I didn't know this was going to happen. Why are we thinking about this now? I just want to stay in pediatrics. This feeling that we are discussing it late and that this is just thrown on them and their next appointment has to be with the adult neurologist. It can sometimes take a long time to get an appointment given the number of people in your community. Um, and I think some of the community programs that we have, they're often not designed for patients who have uncontrolled seizures, behavioral challenges, and cognitive impairment. And in that way, many families can be unsupported and feel quite alone in this process. There are clinical barriers too. Um, when we think about Gervais syndrome in, in particular, um, finding adult providers who accept patients' insurance can be a barrier. Finding an adult provider who has that comfort to care for your, your loved one with that syndrome um, can, can also be a barrier. Um, adult providers can often uh, not have the comfort to manage um, the intellectual disability and behavioral challenges. It's not only about the seizures. Um, and sometimes parents and caregivers can sometimes feel that they are being dismissed in that regard. I think another uh, perspective that's important is this notion that in the adult world, we're often caring for patients 
who are able to functionally care for themselves um, or who may have somebody helping with them, but these rare epilepsy syndromes, these patients often need um, a, a lot of help in terms of their decision making and having a proxy help them. And really having a provider uh, in the adult space who is involving people in those decisions and helping people along the way is essential. And it can be the case that often um, families don't always feel that they're getting that. We need to think about the perceived negative aspects of care. There can be perceptions about the pediatric healthcare system and the adult healthcare system. Um, in the pediatric healthcare system, there can be a perception of lack of information about adult issues and needs. And there is a perception often that there's an absence of transition preparation. There also is a perception of the lack of autonomy promotion in this um, um, space. In the adult healthcare system, uh, there can be a perception of a lack of knowledge about epilepsies and comorbidities, as, as I've mentioned before. And there's definitely difficulties in global and multidisciplinary care and the perception that we are unable to do so in the adult healthcare system. It, there's also a perception in the adult healthcare system um, that there may be less dedicated time in the clinic um, and that parents are less involved and accepted in decisions and in the visits. So, Rima, turning to you, uh, can you tell us about the changing needs of patients as they transition from pediatric to adulthood? And with those changing needs, how do we incorporate those into a transition plan? A part of the preparation of the transition is we will have in this period changes in the phenotype. Basically, for instance, in Dravet syndrome, we might have less seizures. Seizures might have more during nighttime and not during daytime. In other diseases like tuberous sclerosis complex, we are focusing definitely much on the seizures and on the problem of seizures. But we know very well that there might be other organ involvement. There might be also in Dravet syndrome, musculoskeletal and the problems of the crouch gait. The, the other issue that is very important is all of these non-seizure or beyond the seizure issues that are almost constant in those children and young adults and mental health, neuropsychiatric issues, behavioral problems, sleep disturbances, and all of these problems should be taken care of during this transition period, prepared and presented for our adult colleagues. All of these points should be in, included very clearly in the education for the patient, for the family, and for the pediatric group. So when we think about how to achieve a successful transition and the transfer, our goal is to leave no one behind and to leave no symptom behind during this transition. So definitely identifying the adult neurologist and the Christine discussed very nicely about this difficulty is very important. A very good communication should be established the pediatric team within a multidisciplinarity created and answered a good context for all the needs of the patient, the holistic care. So all of this should go into this transition and we need to prepare these checklists because we might forget points that are important. For some patients, especially for those with lennox gastro syndrome, here we might have uh, different etiologies. And especially with the genetic input in those patients, we might revisit the etiology for a patient that was diagnosed 15 years ago, where we did not have all of these possibility. We should provide for the families and the patients and our adult colleague this information. Another point that is very important in Lennox Gasto, where we all know that the aspects can disappear in adulthood. So sometimes if we do not have this very clear diagnosis criteria, we can miss understand this transfer and transition, and our adult colleagues will go on into etiological endless exams and will not have 
the right diagnosis. We talked about the multidisciplinarity. It is our everyday work in the pediatric field, in the epilepsy and comorbidities, especially in DEEs. This multidisciplinarity is what we should prepare before the transfer. We did not talk about some aspects where pediatric people sometimes can miss. Sometimes we forget about some major issue, which is about the guardianship, which is about the trust fund. And these points are really important. In France, for instance, it might take six months to one year to organize all of these issues. Another point that families and parents are aging. And we should identify who might be the kind of referee person and who can cross the generations. Sometimes it's a brother or sister, but sometimes it's a young uncle, a young auntie, and so on. We all know, even in patients with intellectual disability, with severe uh, ASD, those patients they will be an environment where we should promote their social development, their autonomy, whatever their disability is, and to have programs that are adapted to that. So if I try to summarize a bit, we should have this checklist or key elements in our transition plan. Definitely, the medical course is very important. The history of the patient is very important. All the comorbidities that we discussed about psychiatric, motor, sleep, and so on, should be emphasized. The level of the intellectual disability and the, what the patient is able to do, we should be able to summarize this in a very structured way. The goals of care. We are in patients where seizure freedom is very difficult to achieve with the family and with the patients when it's a possible, discussing about what is really important, what is meaningful, what are the aims of our therapy. What we tried as medication is important. We should prepare kind of a table with the drugs that were given. What was their efficacy on seizures? What were their side effects? How they were tolerated? And let us not forget also about the galenic form of the medication that was given. I talked about the community, the financial and the social support the result of the psychological screening, and, and very important, the seizure emergency plan that we should adapt also for the patient. We might have some recipes that are really efficient with some rescue medication, and we should blame it for our adult neurologist colleague. We have some checklists that we can think about. We have to think about the transition very early. It is not to do everything during one clinic or two clinics, but we can think about discussing these different issues at different moments. We should repeat many times many of these points. We should adjust the plans the expectation of the families, and when possible, always of the patient. We should emphasize that the care that we are providing and these different steps will be very well considered and the patient will transfer to a group that is aware of all of these points. So, Christina Rima, thank you. An incredibly thoughtful discussion. And I think important the focus on treating the child as they transition into adulthood, not only treating the seizures, but taking care of the whole person. So kind of then thinking about this, and Rima, you kind of addressed this, but when should we really start the discussions about the transition to adult care and what different factors might influence that timing? I had the opportunity to participate in, in uh, Ontario 
uh, Epilepsy Implementation Task Force. And this is one example, I would say, about how we can think about it. We can really initiate to discuss about this at the age of 10 years, 11 years, and sometimes we shift it a bit uh, later on for patients with severe intellectual disability, definitely we should introduce the concept before the age of 14 years, 15 years. And we should go head to head with the social worker, with the neuropsychologist, with the psychiatrist, and trying to have a holistic view. There is a very important time that we call the the preparation of the transfer, and we should take almost one year to finalize this uh, transition summary and that we can validate that the adult care team and the other specialist that will take care about the child. So as you can see, the timeline is really going from 12 years almost to 18 years and different kind of transition uh, uh, programs might have some overlap in in care, might have some common uh, clinics during this last year. Again, it will depend about each center and the possibilities. Important factors that also might accelerate the transition The psychiatric disorders transition, especially in these diseases, should be with some checklist and should be really adapted for each patient, for each family, and for each setting of care. So thanks, Rima. A lot of issues, and I agree, it's it's individual for each patient that we transition. So, Christine, what strategies do you think we could use to address some of these barriers that we've been discussing? I think kind of taking a step back and reviewing some really kind of key principles here. Number one, preparation, preparation, preparation. Number two, repetition within that preparation. And lastly, I'd say collaboration, collaboration uh, with um, not only our partners in the pediatric and adult world, but also within the family unit or the caregiver and and patient unit. It's important to kind of think about uh, data that we have and some suggestions that we have um, from uh, caregivers of patients with uh, Dravet syndrome. Um, Some suggestions have been that we really need a transition navigator position, A, a key person who's doing the organizing to help you navigate the complexities of the healthcare system and do so in a way that you're recognizing the preparation, the repetition, and linking people together, not only the pediatric space and the adult space and the providers therein, but also the family unit that is traversing that. Um, Preparing the family for transition shortly after diagnosis. The more that we talk about it early and integrate it into the discussion, even at the time of diagnosis that you will be launching eventually into adulthood, starts getting into the family's head and to everybody in the healthcare spaces. Head. We, again, need to recognize that not all patients can self-advocate. Um, and additionally, not all parents and caregivers are effective advocates. We need to realize that our healthcare system is extremely complicated, very difficult to traverse, and we need to come to, as providers and healthcare clinicians and a team, need to come to all of our encounters with that awareness. Um, We also need to include non-clinical topics of concern. And what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, we need to think about social aspects, community aspects, guardianship, um, having these things discussed along the way and even introduced even through things such as clinic newsletters would be very helpful. Uh, Finally, um, uh, to create a multidisciplinary uh, transition team would really be uh, a a key thing to help um, our families, uh, our caregivers and patients uh, make this journey through transition and transfer. Even in the absence of a um, comprehensive multidisciplinary team, it's really important to acknowledge who the team members are that you need to reach out to to help you overcome barriers as a provider to uh, provide the care to the patients that they need. 
Yeah, thanks, Christine. I think that one of the things that's been amazing to watch over the past several years is the growing partnership between the patient advocacy groups, the medical community, and the patient community that I think benefits all of us, especially our patients and their families. So then thinking about the role of the neurologist in the transition process, um, what are your thoughts about the roles of the child neurologist and the adult neurologist in this process? I think what the child neurologist should do is to discuss the expectation of future transition and to see how the family and the patient can see this expectation to build this transition program and this transfer patient self-management skills should be really assessed carefully during this period because it will help to build this uh, uh, summary of the situation and it will help us to see to which setting we should transfer the patient. What we need also, and we emphasized it already, is to engage the patient when possible and the caregiver in this stepwise transition uh, planning with this repetition, with this education to have a good transfer uh, readiness. There is also uh, the discussion of the legal competency with the caregivers. And here we already discussed about the intellectual intellectual disability uh, issue. The vocational uh, personnel, the community providers, uh, the school and other healthcare providers should be also consulted I'm thinking about the physiotherapy. I'm thinking about the speech therapist. What should the pediatric neurologist do and prepare is mainly this communication with the adult provider, with the adult health care uh, giver, to be sure that this transfer will occur uh, smoothly, but mainly will cover all the patient needs and all the patients and the family expectations. Thank you, Rima. And now kind of turning from the pediatric provider perspective, Christine, to the adult neurology provider perspective, what are your thoughts about what the neuro adult neurologist can do to help prepare for patients with these rare um, pediatric onset epilepsies to transition to adult care? Um, I think first and foremost, I'm going to recommend just the first initial step of just take a big breath in and it's it, you're going to be able to do it. I think I think sometimes we underestimate um, our adult neurologists. There's a lot we can do to prepare. Um, so getting the medical records, making sure you're get a, getting um, a summary, not a, a you know a book, uh, to help you be ready for that first appointment is really key. Now whether you need to engage your kind of clinic infrastructure to help you with that, that's something I, you can, can be an ask in going forward. Um, I think recognition that what you are going to be helping with is not only the care of the patient but also the family unit that's um, making this journey and being transferred as well, and recognizing the perspective of uh, the parents or the caregiver in that process and being prepared for that, I think is also a really important step. Um, I think additionally, it's really important to recognize and just be prepared for the fact that, you know what, in that first appointment in particular, you're not necessarily going to be able to address every single need. That's an unrealistic expectation. And so really that first appointment and that transfer is to begin to get to know people, to begin to have a starting point and to begin to build that relationship. And additionally, to begin to identify who those partners are you need on your team to help care for that patient. And you may um, actually be part of a multidisciplinary clinic that will help with preparation in that case. But just recognizing it's not only just about the seizures, but about more than that and kind of thinking about what is needed and what maybe are resources you need in providing this care. I think thinking about things like a navigator in terms of having a formalized program is really important in terms of preparation. It can help with some of the things I'm bringing up in terms 
terms of getting the records, ensuring reviewing of appointments, ensuring the team that is either there or will be there in terms of future appointments are discussed. Lastly, I just want to bring up the, the concept of um, our future generation of adult neurologists and thinking about preparing to be able to care for these patients. It's also incumbent upon us to be integrating these discussions and these thought processes and, and what we've learned so far um, in teaching the future generation so that we will all be prepared moving forward. So those are the things that I'm, I'm thinking about as an adult neurologist in terms of the preparation. Um, thanks a lot. I think it's been a really helpful and very stimulating discussion. I think kind of the ma main point is that many of these children are transitioning into uh, adulthood. Many people living with Dervé, with LGS, with TSC, with the other DEs are becoming and are adults, and it is important to develop a care system for them. I also agree yeah. that starting the transition early uh, is really important, cannot make it just a sudden change in the healthcare um team for the patient and the family. And that, the uh, like Trima said, the timeline should be tailored uh, and planned to the level of disability. That has, it's going to be different for each patient. Not One size will not fit all. Um, with these DEs, the cognitive impairment, intellectual disability is a very common factor, uh, and it will and it should affect the timing of transition. And then key elements, as Reem and Christine, you both have alluded to, the key, key elements in transition plan will definitely include the patient's epilepsy history, the current and past medications, what medications have been on the past and were they not effective, were they not tolerated. Seizure emergency plans are really important. One size also doesn't fit all with seizure emergency plans, and we need to know what works for each patient. In addition, the community, social, legal, and financial support, all of those are really important matters and factors that kind of change as the, as the patient transitions from pediatric to adult. And I also do think, and I agree with both of you, that the transition period does give us an opportunity, though, to take a step back, look at the patient, revisit, especially for those with Lennox Gastaut, where we might not know the underlying etiology, um, take a step back and fresh set of eyes to kind of look at, reassess the diagnosis, because that could have significant impact on that individual's um, life, care, um, moving forward. So there are a growing number of resources available for the transition process. I Rima and Christine, I'd really like to thank you. I, I really am excited because I know both of you think very passionately about this issue and spend a lot of time thinking about transition, how to make it work for our patients, both from the pediatric perspective and the adult perspective, and as importantly, the family perspective. Uh, so thank you very much. And I think it was a great discussion. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating in this activity. Uh, so please continue to answer the questions that follow and complete the evaluation. Uh, and thank you very much for your time today.